And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of 6083. Which can be, which can, which is leading heavily into the science fiction fantasy, although far more old school than su than some approaches. The one and only Jason M. Oberman. How you doing today, man? Or tonight? I am, I am pleased to be here. And yeah, it's, it's tonight. It's afternoon, I guess. So yeah, yeah. Very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. So. I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Uh, of course. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Right. Well, you know, I knew you were going to ask that question, so... I um, ask everybody that question. It's tradition. Exactly. So, um, it was uh, 1982, and I was visiting a friend's house, and they had a game out, and it was had all these crazy dice on the table. And keep in mind that I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. And so this was my first exposure to dice that weren't six-sided. And um, there was all kinds of cool stuff going on. And I, I don't remember if they let me play or not, or whether I just got to watch. But it had a deep and lasting impact on me. And it was it was, uh, it was AD&D. And, um, if we're talking, uh, you, said, you said 82? Yep, yep. Probably eight. I'm going to take a stab in the dark. It was probably AD and D um, first, not second. Yep. Nope. First edition. And um, I remember looking through the monster manual um, and seeing all the stuff in there, and they had a couple modules, and um, I was just immediately intrigued. And um, being out in the middle of nowhere, you know. I didn't have any, like, outlet to, like, I couldn't go and buy anything, and as far as I knew, like, D&D &D was the only thing, and so, um, I, you know, talked to my buddy, and he, and he was kind of putting together something that was, like, science fiction, and I was like, oh, you could do that? And he's like, yeah, you can make your own stuff, and, um, I just kind of went from there, and I have been chasing after it ever since, like, it's, it's been a part of my life for a very long time, but um, but it was magical in a way that I can't explain. Although I'm sure for a lot of people listening that they probably had similar experiences with our, you know, whatever RPG got to them, you know. Hmm. But that's how it started. I can get, I can certainly get that. Now, with the now, um, how long? Were, how long did it take before... I know you mentioned AD&D be, being your starting point, but um, mm -hmm. how long did it take before you ve before you ventured out of that? Especially since, obviously, 6083 is, go is a science fiction fantasy project, which is quite, a, which is quite the leap from AD&D. From, uh, yep. Well, the... Um... What happened uh, was that, you know, I really liked, uh, you know, the idea of D&D, &D, and I kind of understood what was going on from what I got to see, um, but I really, really wanted something sci-fi, and being where I was, I didn't have any kind of connections to where, like, I found out years later that Traveler was a thing, and I remember at some point somebody mentioning something like Gamma World um, was out, but, um, and then I don't... Star Frontiers actually wasn't out for a couple more years, I don't think. But, um, but yeah, so as far as I was concerned, there, there really wasn't anything. And so um, that's that's why it, that I went in that direction. And um, for better or for worse, um, I decided that I wasn't going to use D&D as a template. I wanted to create my own thing. And, um, and I did. And it was uh, the first draft of it was pretty rough. Of course, you know, I was just a kid. Yeah. But um, um, Star Frontiers yeah. came out in '82. 
82. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. Um, so, yep. Uh, and I eventually did end up playing Star Frontiers, like in 85, I think, I started playing Star Frontiers. A buddy of mine ran a game of Star Frontiers uh, for us. Um, and that was pretty cool. But um, but by that time, I was already on the second edition, of, you know, the second draft of the game. So um, I was pretty much committed in, into, you know, going the direction that I was. So... Um, but, yep. Mm -hmm. Now, going with going with science fiction. Mm -hmm. What what was for you? What's the appeal with science fiction, especially the especially the style of science fiction that you're going with a more a more mili more militaristic approach. So I think that most of the sci-fi that I was exposed to um, at, at that age, I was reading a lot of uh, Ray Bradbury, Robert Heinlein, um, Clark, and you know, just different sci-fi authors like that. Um, I found David Drake, a big fan of, of, of David Drake's work, and. Um, and I had, you know, as a kid, I had watched, like, Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers, and I really liked that idea of that kind of military unit, you know, fighting against the odds kind of, uh, you know, theme. And that's really what I was kind of attracted to. Even Star Wars, um, in its own way, is, it's, it's science fantasy, but, you know, there's a military bent to it. And... Um, and that's how come it ended up going in that direction. It was just, for whatever reason, it was easy for me to, to latch on to, and uh, it was something that my friends that, and, uh, you know, that were playing the game with me also really liked, so um, I just continued pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm. So, with, so, um, with that, with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, you meant. I think you meant. You mentioned Starship Troopers, but what were, what would you say were some of the other films, bo books, etc., that served as an inspiration for sixty eighty three? Um, okay, well, definitely Star Wars. Um, I think that was, you know, an inspiration. Um, there are pieces of Star Trek. Um, when Aliens came out, Aliens was a huge inspiration for me, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, because that was, you know, specifically as a horror, but it's kind of, it, it really is military sci-fi, you know, the way that it's set up. Um, and then, like I said, I was also reading David Drake, so Hammer Slammers. I don't know if you're familiar with that series, but... Um, I'm, not, I'm not. Could you... Could you give me the skinny on that? So, Hammer Slammers is a military sci-fi series uh, by David Drake, and he was a Vietnam veteran. And I, um, in, in he, when he uh, became a civilian, he started writing, you know, military sci-fi. But uh, the series itself is is about a a company of uh, mercenaries called Hammer Slammers, and they're uh, a unit of heavy armor, so tanks, primarily, like tanks and uh, APCs and things like that, and it's about their exploits around the universe, but it's, you know, it's pretty dark and gritty, and um, you can tell that uh, Drake has also, you know, he's transcribed, or, you know, he's definitely used some of his personal experiences from Vietnam, you know, in that, and applied it to a sci-fi setting, so pretty compelling stuff. It's, it's pretty violent, actually, but it's also um, really, really good series. And I highly recommend that for anybody who likes that genre. Yeah. And I will, I will note, I, ca I can't help but find it, amu find it amusing how many, t how, um, when I've covered oh, military SF style RPGs o over the years, um, there always there always seems to be a downstreamness between that and people who have um ser who have served. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And it, and you know what? It, 
you got to do what you know, right? And that's like that's something that I know very well. And, so, and now I, I'm I gravitated to it because I have I um even though I've never served some somehow I've ex I've acquired enough military humor that some people think I did. You know, I, I actually I was picking that up, and I had wondered about that myself uh, from some of the comments that you made. So no, I've I've never I have never served, but there's times where I've ha where I've had people who have ha who have served or or the like, and just just listening and absorbing a lot of a lot of stories. Plus, there's a few YouTubers I follow who who have served and give their perspectives on things. Yeah. Um, off, often with a bit, often with that same bit of humor. Um, yeah, it's one. It's. I know. I know it's hard. I know it's harsh to make crayon jokes when it comes to Marines, but given some of the stories <laughs> I've given, um, uh, I think there's justification. Yeah, yeah. That's that's ongoing. Uh, that's an ongoing rivalry. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, um, you tease them about their crayons. I, um, I love them. I almost I almost died laughing when I when I first heard about the digital camo debacle, and how much money yeah. was spent on that shit. Oh yeah, yeah, it was a big question mark for everybody, you know. And the Marines got it first, and then the Army had to too. And we're like, why, you know, uh, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> along with along with one guy, there's one guy there's one guy who I've who I've been in campaigns with who um, served in the Navy and. I'm not sure if he was trying to play the stereotype or anything like that, but he, but he dis he did not dispute the stereotype of sleeping with everything that that had legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I sometimes I think that um, from the diff different services, I think that different kinds of people are drawn to specific services. Like you know, it just appeals to them. Mm -hmm. So. You know, and I think that's kind of like where people land. So I think it's funny because yeah, there are some stereotypes that are, um, you know, kind of validated by by the majority's actions there. Stereotypes so, don't come up. Stereotypes don't come out of nowhere. No, they do not. You know, um, they're they're based on <laughs> they're based on something. Yeah, ev um, I'm from Minnesota, and every and everybody talks. Everybody uh, makes jokes about Minnesota nice, except. The um, except the so the reason that that the reason that that phrase is a thing is because it's used ironically, because there's <laughs> especially if you go further out of out of the Twin Cities, there's a bit of passive aggressive niceness. It's not full yeah. Canadian niceness, but it but there's some um, downstreamness. Yeah, I've got a um, one of one of my very best friends. In fact, he's he's been playing sixty eighty three with me for over twenty years. Um, and he's also he, he does some editing for me, and he's from Minnesota. He's from Wilmer. I'm not sure where that falls in. That's a little that's, a, that's a little ways off from me. <laughs> yeah. Uh. But speaking of that, I'd like you to walk me through um, the cha the chain of events that that made you go okay. I Okay, nothing, nothing's doing it for me, so I need to make my own. Well, that was kind of um, the the my buddy and his family, like they were the only ones. Like a little bit of background where I grew up, and like it is really isolated in in Alaska where I grew up. I did not grow up in a city. I grew up on a river, and um, just to give you the idea of like maybe the kind of population density we're talking about. My, my graduating class from high school was four kids, and it was the largest graduating class ever, um, to my knowledge. So uh, there is maybe in a, I don't know, in a 200-mile radius, there's, there's maybe something like uh, 40 or 50 families where I grew up, and, you know, no roads, um, no telephones at that time. Um, so it was just, I had this one friend of mine and, and he and his family played D&D &D, and that was like the first and only place I'd ever seen that and so the the um, the reason why I was so driven to create my own was that there was literally nothing else for me and also I couldn't get my hands on D&D &D either because 
all their rules belong, you know, their rule books belong to their family. They belong to their dad. And he was like super protective of them, you know. Um, Given that this so, was the 80s, the height of the satanic panic, I can't. Oh my believe. God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I want to say that that might be the reason why uh, I really didn't get to play the game because um, I think that they were concerned that, you know, my parents did not have a problem with that. It was no issue, you know. But there might have been some concern that, you know, like that if they let me play, that somehow that I was, you know, leading, they were leading uh, somebody's kid down the, you know, the dark path and. Um, and I definitely saw that at that time, but, you know, but man, you know, it was so cool and I wanted to play it so bad. I couldn't, there wasn't anything sci-fi. And so I was just like all in on, on creating my own thing. And yeah. And, you know, didn't have much else to do because of where I lived, you know? So, um, yeah, I went all in on it. I made the first edition of it. It was like 30, 35 page and pages and it was pretty awful and then um but my friends actually you know i had a handful of friends that played it with me and they really loved it and so i remember um the following year like the original rule books the original rule book um you know it had so many things scratched out where you know stuff just didn't work and so you know i had to be replaced with another system or another kind of stat or something like that and we were getting, I know I was getting piles of notes on, you know, different weapons and, you know, creatures and spaceships and all kinds of things. And I was like, well, you know what? I can't deal with this anymore. It's a mess. I've got to create something new. You know, I've got to expand this. And so I went around writing this, you know, I went about writing the second draft of the game. And then that's where it really came alive for my friends. And even though we had a small, you know, community, it, you know, whenever I visited my friends, we were playing 6083, like, the majority of the time. So um, I had to make a lot of different revisions and fix things that were broken. But by the time that I got out of high school, it was running really smoothly. And it is an odd game. Like, I'm not... There's there's no way to describe it. And that's been one of my... I won't say it's a concern, but, you know, people like familiarity. And 6083 ain't familiar. It's a definitely a different system. Then you got so. a crazy guy like me who ju who who jumps stri who jumps headlong into in, into the un into the unfamiliar. And I appreciate you for it. Well, so, well, well, I I people said I'm crazy when I said one thing on my bucket list is that I, is that I don't want to do base jumping. I want to do a halo jump. <laughs> nice. Oh. Uh. I know it's never going to happen, but let a man dream, damn it. You know, I mean, you could you could do the civilian equivalent to it. Yeah. Um no, cuz it wouldn't be the first time I've I've jumped from a high place and I've ar I've already done skydiving one at one point and I I was I was somebody who would be crazy enough to ju to jump off a billboard on onto a crash pad. Oh my god. Well, I've never done that. I've skydiving. I've done skydiving, but I've never jumped um, I did onto a crash pad. I did stunt work. I did stunt work once, which was one time too many, and one of the things <laughs> we had to do was a bar fight. Oh. Um, and um somebody forgot to gim somebody forgot to gimmick the bar stools. Uh-oh. You're supposed to gimmick them so that they so that they break easily. Right. So imagine getting hit about a dozen times with wooden bar stools. Yeah, it just got real, right? Yeah, now now multiply that over three days. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, so lucky you got out of there, man. Well, by the time by the time I was done, I called I called up my boss and I said I'm not coming in today because I could barely get yeah. out of I could barely get out of bed. But I bet it was an authentic looking bar fight, though. As well as close as you could get with it with the with the tiny budget that we had. <laughs> but I've um I've learned I learned a long t I learned a long time ago to not to not assume that there's a certain way to do things. 
Um, I like to call that kind of mindset designed by gospel. It makes sense to me. I understand that. Um, the video game example that I, that I use is I resented the I resented the idea that you that that if somebody was to make a cast that if a, that say a Castlevania game has to be in the Metroidvania style instead of something more akin to the SNES and SNES era. Gotcha. Oh, um, now doing thing doing things because it's a, because it's a good it's a goodish idea. I'm perfectly fine with that, but doing it because because it's what's expected. Not always a good not always a good idea because as you you probably studied this when it comes when it comes to studying military procu things like military procurement and the like. Sometimes the customer doesn't know what the hell he wants. No, that's true. Or he or he asks for or he asks for something but um he does not know what he asks for. You know, I think a lot of times um, what that translates to, and it, it goes out through so much of society, it, it carries through, is that people see something and they're like, ooh, I want that. Um, but they don't really know what they're asking for. I feel like I'm just reiterating what you're saying differently, yeah. but, but it's absolutely true. So, like, you as a supplier of whatever, um, if you can sort of understand what the client really wants, then you might be able to give to serve them better than they understand, you know. But some but sometimes sometimes all sometimes the the um builder the builder doesn't matter as long as the check clears. Yeah, that's true. Oh. Um, the I remember I remember te I remember in in one of Texas videos, he used the he used the Baron class when talking about BattleTech as an example of this kind of thing because it was supposed to be this ult this ultimate destroyer class warship, but because of the fact that it was built on the idea of a of a destroyer instead of actually being able to do it, um, by the time by the time they fixed a lot of the early problems, it was too slow to actually be a destroyer. Right. Which a slow de a slow destroyer is kind of self defeating. Yeah, yeah. Now, what what's interesting with, what's interesting with what you mentioned about it about it being unorthodox, uh, is the is the fact that you have really two die resolution systems. One yep. is a percent. One is percentile, except for mm -hmm. except for combat. Where it is a three D six. Yes. Now, when it first off, in your in your, what made you want to go? What made you want to go with um two set two separate die systems? And was there a point early on where you had considered um a more unified approach of everything under three D six or a D or D one hundred? Well, the um. The during its early development, it was um, it was all D six because I didn't have any uh, any of those other dice. Yeah, I'd only seen seen them with D and D, and so when I got back home and I'm like, I'm gonna make this thing. Um, I raided, you know, my family's Yahtzee set, so I had a bunch of D sixes, and so um, so everything was around uh, D sixes, and um, I built the combat system first. And uh, after we played it for a little while, it started working really well, and it was a really good resolution system for combat. And then we were doing D sixes for like, um, you know, skill checks and um, ability checks and things like that. But I wasn't happy with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, at at some point, a few years down the line, I finally got my hands on percentile dice, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to convert all the skill checks and ability checks over to um, percentile because it makes sense. It's way easier. There's a lot more variation and variety. It's a lot easier to, you know, it's just a lot easier to, to use in-game. But the 3D6 combat system was so ingrained in the game, and my players loved it so much that there was no way I could get rid of that. So they were fine with me moving over to 
percentile dice for skill checks. That was fine, but you know they would have burned me at the stake if I had gotten rid of the the 3D six resolution for combat. So that's how come we ended up with two two separate systems. I will say though that in in gameplay, it's really kind of irrelevant because in and uh, in actual play, what happens is is that um, in a physical game, if the players see me reach for 3D6, that's their visual cue that combat is beginning. And so it's it's almost like a um, it's almost like a trigger for them, you know, that if the 3D6 comes out, it means that things just got got real and that combat is starting. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but yeah, that's how it came about. Yeah, and I'd I'd say something that might that might inti- that might intimidate folks who who um are who are aren't aren't used to the bigger picture is the is the way the comparison matrix works with hit rank. Mm-hmm. And that's for me for me the um the big thing that I ended up I ended up comparing it to when I was going through it. Is the is the is the a, is the active action control table that's used in that's used in stuff like Marvel Face Rip, as well as um, Ze, as well as Zeb's fantasy role playing game, which is a successor to the to TSR Conan. What's interesting is I've never played Face Rip, but I have heard that comparison as well. I think it's beca- I think it's because of the fact that you're that you're comparing you're comparing an attacker and defender rank, and then using that as the as I understand it the baseline for what you'd need to roll in order to hit. Yep, that's absolutely correct. Um, so, so I'm get I'm guessing that'd be that'd be a accurate way to describe how the how the um, how attack and defense works. You look at the attacker's hit rank. And the and the defender's hit rank, and that determines the minimum result you need in order to hit. Yes, and um, so it, it and it's basically it the the baseline number is eleven, um, which is a little higher. If you look at the exact average for like three d six, it's ten, but um, but it's a little bit higher than that. But um, but yeah. You, you have it exactly right. You compare the defender against the attacker, and you um, essentially, if you're just to do the math without the comparison matrix, you just add you um, add or subtract the difference, and you know from eleven or to eleven, and then that's the number that you that's your target number with a three d six. So is it is it a case where you're where you're going to be looking at the row and then the column? Yes, it's always from the t- it's always read from the top down. Mm-hmm. So um, whether you're the defender or the attacker, whoever's rolling the device is or the dice, not the device. Whoever's rolling dice is looking at the top row and then seeing where it intersects from the side, yeah. and that's that's their number. Mm-hmm. So with with that in mi- with that in mind, um, one thing that I found kind of interesting that you that the game has. Is the is its profession system, and I think what I'm curious what I'm curious about with that was how did how did this come about and what in in early iteration was there was there an attempt to try and do a more traditional class based approach before it before it re, before that hit a wall? Um, no, um, the. You know, I, I jokingly say that 6083 is, is a game that was built on my ignorance of, of role-playing games. <laughs> because while I watched, you know, D&D being played, you know, I heard a lot of terms being thrown around, like, oh, you know, oh, my dwarf's a fighter, and, you know, I'm going to attack. But I didn't understand classes. Like, I didn't know that that's what they were at that time. Um, so when I got back to making my own thing, I was like, okay, well... Uh, I think at first I like landed solidly, it's, you know, on Star, on Star Wars. You know, it's like okay, I want to have these different things. You know, I'm a smuggler. I want to, you know, I want somebody who's a, you know, a soldier. You know, maybe a medic. You know, so, but I didn't understand them as classes. 
And what I actually ended up doing, because the, the first draft was really rough, but during the second one, I wanted a, um, a system that uh, was kind of tiered. So there's different tiers of professions. Mm -hmm. And um, so they don't really function as classes. They function as skill sets, though. And um, because it is a skill-based game, um, predominantly, but you do have those those different professions, and and that's that's where that was all born out of. Like I designed this thing to say, like, okay, well, if you have a certain level of stats, then these are the professions that you can get. You know, you can get them if they're within your range. So if you have great roles for your character in the beginning, um, you might have a really good profession, so you have some additional skills in your skill set. Um, if you roll terribly, then you know then you might have a terrible profession. Um, but it, it, it started that way, and then as we had need of things, you know, like my friends were asking, like, oh, I want to track, um, you know, I want to track this animal, I want to track this um, creature, um, you know, and I'd be like, okay, well, you know, that's going to be your vision or your senses that does that. And, but, you know, my player is like, well, I want to, I want to be more proficient. And so we started adding skills to the game. And so the skills were so wildly popular with my core group. I had a couple core groups um, that we just started making more and more skills. And and it just became a skill-based game. And the professions, um, they're not classes because, you know, there is no leveling up your profession to include you know include other things as you, as you get training points you can buy additional skills to augment your proficiencies and things like that mm -hmm. um but that's what became popular and i don't think i understood really fully what a class was until um probably about 10 years later my buddy was explaining shadow run to me and um and I started to like kind of get a picture of like, okay, well, now I kind of understand that. And some fo folks were talking D and D with me, and I played a little bit more D and D at that point too. And and then so I was like, okay, so these are kind of like career paths, you know, in D and D. And that's like that's not what I got, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> now. Given that a lot of the a lot of the base ability generation is is rooted in D six, yep. Um, as a general rule, how do how do you convert those D sixes into into percentiles? So the most of them are just by ten percent. So like if your vision, you know, is six, then you're gonna that's a sixty percent base. There's a couple that are different. Um, BC, um, which is your balance and coordination, that's that's two dice. And so, um, the so that's on five uh, percent. And then, but and then if you look at like RAM and um, or PER in particular, like that's just the that's just the base stat. So if your PER is like fifty five, then fifty five percent is your base. So it's either around five or ten percent, depending on the stat, and and all those came about because of specific requirements in game, and that's just kind of the percentages kind of got moved around to to where we needed them, where they had the best ranges um, for gameplay, and so you know there's not a uh, you know it, it, everything is not by ten percent. It's there's a couple different ways. There's three different versions of that, and it just depends on the stat. And I explain it, but um, it is unorthodox for, for people who are used to, say, like Call of Cthulhu, where everything is just, you know, it's one version. D&D is the same way. I think most games are, actually. There's a few that aren't, but they are, at, but they are very much in the, mi in the minority. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the term uh, that I often use for it is all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. Yep. 
And I think that um, it's kind of funny because uh, during the development of this, um, especially when we're fleshing out, um, you know, what percentages would be what, and uh, that in a way, um, without being influenced by other game systems, that uh, we kind of came to a point where things were were sort of paralleling some of those other systems as well. So, um, it's still a little bit different, but you know, but like you said, you know, it's all leading to the same result. And I think um, during you know any time any time that I've uh, played with new players, I'd say probably by the second or third session, like, it's a non-issue. You know, they're used to it by then, and they understand what means what. Mm -hmm. Now, if, now, one thing, one thing that I did, one thing that I did see regarding the, um, regarding the way advancement work is that if I'm, if I'm reading it correctly, instead of, instead of, instead of having a, t a typical, instead of having a typical, re a typical level system, um, missions have have le have levels in that, and that determines the rewards of them. Yeah, so there's a couple different currencies that play in the system, and I think that the during leveling, this is where like the game ends up being kind of like a hybrid between a class system and a skill based system, um, because you're you're earning training points at the end of a mission, depending on the duration of the mission, and you might get some bonuses. Mm -hmm. Those things are used to improve your skills, your abilities, uh, you know, buy additional skills and um, things like that. So those are like a really important currency. But every time that you rank up, you know, say from rank, you know, one to two or whatever, you're also gaining um, your proficiency on your core combat stats. And um, the reason why that is is because one of the problems that I had early on was balance and I needed a way to balance the characters out and um, just having them have skills wasn't doing it because you know I couldn't depend on my players to um, enhance their characters or improve their characters in, in a standardized direction hmm. you know so I, maybe I would have somebody who really wanted to have awesome you know hearing or wanted to you know be a swordsman or something like that but the game's not set up for that kind of specialization. So I had to implement that kind of um, ranking system where as a person, as a character ranks up, then they, they get a certain amount of combat ability and therefore survivability along with that. And that helps balance out the TRPs. And, uh, and it just uh, it, it works better that way. That way I know that if I've got like, if I'm going to do a campaign and um, somebody shows up and they've got a you know rank five character and it's it's a, a campaign for rank seven characters. Then you know we've got to do something or else that person's probably going to die. So, um. but the other thing I the other thing I find kind of interesting is the t is the tier setup for um, for professions because unless I'm unless I'm mistaken on this all that. It's it's not necessarily required for you to ha for you to have a tier one profession and then then to get to tier two and up and upwards. It's just that the higher the tier is, the more stringent the requirement is. Yes, uh, the more stringent the requirement and the better the bonus is. Um, so, um, and that's not to say that uh, you know like tier one profession is terrible. But if you were lucky enough to say get a tier six pr profession, even like something like a team leader, which is like the best uh, profession that you can get from your base roles, um, you know that team leader is going to have you know all kinds of cool skills and is going to be better suited than you know somebody who maybe didn't get into that tier. Maybe you know, I'd say most people end up with like tier three or four to begin with, and um, it just depends on the luck of the role. Um, so yes, you're right. You don't start in a tier one. You start basically where you fall. You know where you fall into the tiers. The tiers are there as a. Uh, they're kind of a a 
the systemic control because uh, you can move from profession to profession. And so they, if you want to move from, like I say, a tier one profession into a tier five profession, you can absolutely do that if you have the points to spend. It's no problem. But that tier is going to dictate how many, how many points you need to spend to get there. So. And I'm, get, I'm guessing that switch that switching professions. Sorry. I'm guessing that when you sw if you switch professions, you don't you don't lose that you don't lose out on benefits or special skills from what you had before. No, it's like a, it's like real life. You know, if um, if you are a plumber, there's no plumbers in the game. But if you're a plumber and then you decide to become a ninja, then you are a ninja plumber. So, um, yeah, everything is cumulative. So. Ideally, like I'm not going to say it's in game because it's all it's all up to the to the player's preference. But there are some elite level, uh, there's some elite tier characters, and um, those are very powerful. They're harder to get, but you know you can certainly save your TRPs and um, maneuver your way into those elite tiers, and then you can be doing some really cool things. Um, but if you want to just be a you know a badass um, character, you can certainly you know burn your TRPs and you know bring your stats up and buy weapons proficiencies and you do just fine there too. Mm -hmm. So now that brings me to to um elite to the elite tiers. Um, sure. Because because uh, of course the one of the first things I noticed is that the Cost between between regular professions and elite is quite a gap, and with and a lot of the elite tier professions are are rooted in the rift. Now, yes, lore wise, would it be apropos of me to say that the rift is is um kind of the representation of the more of the more supernatural the more supernatural types of effects that you see in certain SF. Whether it be yes. psychic powers or the force or some or something in between, that's where this comes in. Yes, the rift is a uh, it's a mystery, and um, it's it produces some it produces people with uh, essentially supernatural powers, and that is you know your observation is absolutely correct. So. And I think, and one of the interesting things that I find with with that is the way you handle casting with the Rift Witch, which first off uses Purr, and yes. se and second and second off, you um, it's not it's not a it's not a set co aside from the stronger ones it's not a set cost it's based it's based on die yep um what made you go with that what made you go with that approach so the rift uh, professions are almost all of them aside from the raptor because the raptor is a, is a different thing um but the other rift professions all of their abilities are based they're either situational or they're triggered by specific situations or they're um, based on PER, which is a uh, physical endurance and reaction. So they have some amazing, some phenomenal abilities, but the player has has to make those decisions like, okay, do I want to burn my physical endurance and reaction? Because in combat, um, that particular stat can be important, important uh, in a lot of different situations, and the lower that stat becomes, the the harder it is to resist things like uh, stuns and, and so on. So, but with the Rift Witch in particular, um, that variability uh, lends itself to a little bit of chaos because that character is it's predominantly a support character. However, it has some extremely powerful abilities, but adding that element of chaos in there makes the characters a little bit more careful about what they do because what I found in play is that a lot of players, if they know something is, is set cost, like, okay, we're backed into a corner and we're pinned down, I want to cast this ability, um, so I'm going to, you know, and it burns, you know, we'll say, um, 
you know, 10 physical endurance and resistance. You know, I'm okay with that. However, if the player is unsure how much that it's actually going to cost, it forces them to really evaluate that process and, and make a different kind of decision. It adds that chaos into the mix, which makes it more interesting. And so that's why the Rift Witch, uh, why those costs are variable. Which def definitely makes se definitely makes sense. Um, and with that with that in with that in mind, what would now that you've now that you've gone full you've gone all in on put on putting out sixty eighty three on a pro in a professional um, approach? Mm -hmm. What do you have? What do you have planned? What do you have planned down the line for um, 6083s as it develops? So, um, right now the the roadmap is is that you know the digital books are out. They've been out since December. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a uh, drive through RPG a game of the week um, when it when it launched, um, but. Um, but since then, uh, every month I do file update, um, and that includes you know adding all the illustrations because while the rules are there, um, you know, and of course they're free to play um, or free to download, but uh, you know there's always improvements to be made, and I am not done doing the art. But at the time that December rolled around, when I put it out, um, I was getting some exposure, and I was actually sort of not ready to launch, but I was like, well, it's sometimes you have to launch when you have to launch, and it's better that the game's out there and available than not. And so um, so since then, you know, I've just been making improvements uh, every month and adding the illustrations. Once the illustrations are done, um, we are on track for a December release for print-on-demand because right now you can't get them on, on print on demand, mm -hmm. um, but they will be available on, t on uh, drive through t uh, drive through t RPG as print on demand uh, no later than December. Although so they're on track for that, but uh, alongside with that, the website is continuously updated. I am working on additional mission adventures um, as quickly as I can. And then uh, there is already work that started on an expansion um, that'll be out in the future. That might actually have a Kickstarter associated with it. Um, and then I think down the road, um, we were talking that we want to do a uh, kind of like an anniversary edition of 6083, where we um, maybe tighten up some of the illustrations and, um, you know, just kind of put a little bit more polish on it. So I hope you keep the but, ads. <laughs> I hope you keep. What's the, that? I hope you keep the whole you in universe at in universe um, ads. That you so and I, I, I appreciate that because um, you know I think any time that I've ever seen that in a game, and the first time I remember seeing that was in West End Star Wars, and I remember they had an ad for. Um, X-Wing, they had like a recruitment poster for the Empire, there was an astromech droid ad and I love that, I love that so much and um, I was like man, if I were ever to make this, you know, to make my game I was, I would have ads and um, and so when I finally, you know my buddy he finally convinced me to do it and um, I was like well, there's going to be ads and uh yeah, it's, that's one of my favorite things uh, about the, the illustrations. That's one of my favorite things to do because I think um, in each ad, you know, there is some subcontext. Um, the game uh, purports to be serious, but it, it is not as serious. And I think that's sort of a callback to being in the military. It's like, you really can't take yourself too seriously. So, like, if you, I think if you look hard enough on those ads, that you're going to see things that that kind of call back to like the ironic nature of like the way certain things are, you know, in in the current mil, you know, our current military, or just the way maybe that some some uh, 
members of the military think about things. So the ads are here to stay. That's the short answer. <laughs> the ads are here to stay, and I'm glad that you like them mm -hmm. because they are my favorite part. Yeah. And with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show here and enjoy the madness that happens. That happens. And anytime oh. you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I have been honored to be a part of this. Um, I've been watching you for so long, and I appreciate uh, everything that you do. Um, and so I, I'm just very, very honored to be here. And yeah, I do hope to be back, because um, we do have expansions and things, and um, you know, I'd like to check back in at some point and um, see. Maybe we could talk about how things have progressed. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>